Thanks for tuning into our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. If you have any questions or want a little bit more info on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at ccoceancity.com. Today, Matthew will be giving a sermon called No Pain, No Gain, The Passion of Prayer. So without further ado, here's Matthew. And I'm going to title today's message, No Pain, No Gain. Athletes know that's true. When you're working out without the pain of breaking a muscle down, there's never gain in the building up of that same muscle. So the passion of prayer, we begin, of course, this is three for me. This is my third service. I've already been at it, so I'm going to give you probably a little bit more energy than you're used to. And if you're saying, what the heck, how can he get any more enthusiastic than we usually are used to him? <sighs> Seatbelts on. I was at the, the music pier this morning in the public, yeah, the public eye eventually with a, a sound system on behalf of Ocean City Tabernacle, preaching the word. So as people are walk, walking by or driving by, they're hearing the gospel crystal clear. So it was amazing this morning. Yes, so here we go. Deep breath in, as Pastor Matt said earlier. We exhale out. As historically and contextually, names were assigned to people to describe their future, their trajectory, and their destiny. And even in the names meeting was their identity. A mother or a father would actually talk about the names meaning before assigning it to a child upon birth. For example, Moses, his name was assigned to him because as his mother put him into a river and Pharaoh's daughter found him, she said, I shall call him Moses, which means drawn out, to draw out. I drawn him out of the river. And remarkably, Moses' ministry would actually live out his name. He would be the one that would, under God's guidance, draw out the people from slavery. Then more remarkably, there's a woman named Hannah. Hannah, she was barren. She could not have a child. She pled with the Lord to open up her womb. And then she said, I promise to dedicate my child to you if I am able to be pregnant. And of course, God answered her prayer. It tells us that she named her son Samuel. Samuel's name means God hears. Of course, God heard me. I'm pregnant. It's remarkable because Samuel's ministry would reflect his name's meaning. But not only does God hear, Samuel would be a prophet who would hear God. The nature of the name was lived out in his life. And then Joseph, as we know the story or the account historically of Joseph sold into slavery from his family, he eventually has God's hand of favor upon him. He's elevated to a position of authority over all of the land of Egypt. And it tells us that he had two sons and he decided to name the first son Manasseh. Manasseh's name means God has caused me to forget my trouble. His second son's name Ephraim. And Ephraim's name means God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Mo or Joseph named his two sons as a reflection of his history, as a reflection of his testimony. It's remarkable. What do names mean? And here we have a very obscure and rare account that we're going to cover together this morning. If you have your Bibles or your apps, you can open them both up. First Chronicles chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 specifically. Now, why is this an obscure and rare account? Because not only does the first Chronicles begin with genealogies, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and even chapter 4 are genealogical builds up from the nation of Israel, specifically in chapter 4, the nation of Judah, name after name, name after name, name after name, and then the Holy Spirit inspires the writer to highlight or focus on or single out one guy, and that one guy in verse 9, his name was Jabez. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Jabez's name means he will cause pain. Think about that. I know many of us in here have been called a pain before, but imagine if your name was pain. Every mention of your name would be a reminder of pain and sorrow. What was it about his birth that made his mother ascribe or declare a painful existence? Some suggest he may have had a birth defect. Some suggest that she may have just lost her husband. 
And of course, the birth of a son would be the memory of sorrow in her life. It's interesting how she put upon him her experience. Before he even could grow, his legacy was pain. As he grew up in his circles, the mentioning of Jabez would have been a reminder or an association with pain. Is anybody there? Anybody's life associated with pain, sorrow, at the mention of your name, at the mention of your circumstances, at the mention of your upbringing, is it a reminder of sorrow and pain? Well, there's a promise, as we're going to discover this morning, that the pain in Jabez's life became the ingredients to passion. Because he begins with a prayer. Now, in spite of the human entry of pain, this is a remarkable truth. God always has a divinely scripted plan. Did you get that, church? In spite of the human entry of pain, God has a divinely scripted plan. What is the plan of pain? Well, pain is not to define us. You are not your pain. Pain is not to confine us. Pain with God's purpose is to refine us. It is the purifier of our character. If I don't have pain in my life, I get comfortable. And when I get comfortable, I get complacent. And when I get complacent, I begin to look more like the world than I do of the Lord. So God says, I want to inspire you. I want to move you. I'm going to allow pain to touch your life. And it's there that the pain begins to purify my character. If you've gone through pain, you know I'm telling the truth. Pain arouses urgency. When you are in pain, it is calling you to respond with a throb, with an ache. C.S. Lewis said it better than me. He said, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And the next time somebody asks why pain, it is God's megaphone to rouse a dead and deaf world. You see, pain I'm proposing became the heart that set Jabez apart. Out of all the names listed in those genealogies, why is Jabez highlighted? Why do we know that his mother named him pain? Why is his history about sorrow, yet why is he called more honorable than his brothers? I am convinced that he was more honorable because the pain in his life made him more vulnerable. Did you get that, church? He became more honorable because the pain in his life made him more vulnerable. And vulnerability in God's economy equals beauty. There's nothing more beautiful than being vulnerable, than being open. And here's the opposite. It's when we are closed in. It's when we allow our pain to shut us down. It's when we allow our pain to harden us, when we become callous as opposed to open to Jesus. That's why pain should get us to call out. But pain made him more honorable than his brothers. What does that even mean? It meant that he was spiritually stronger. Jabez was spiritually stronger than his peers. Jabez was more esteemed in his day than his peers. Consider how remarkable that is. Two chapters prior, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55 says there was a town named Jabez. A town was named after Jabez's life. And those who gathered in that town were called the scribes. And the scribes were the preservers or the protectors of God's scriptures. In other words, a town was named after Jabez's life as a legacy lever, and those who lived in the town would be the protectors of the scriptures. It's remarkable. Though a life may be marked by pain and sorrow, God's sorrowing ones are often God's most honorable ones because sorrow is the gateway to joy. You don't know true joy unless you've experienced true sorrow. That's why Jesus said, you're in sorrow now, but you will have joy. Hey, doesn't a woman go through great pain as she's giving birth? But when that child is in her hands, that joy overwhelms the sorrow. Now, Jabez was more honorable. It's remarkable. Here's the equation. Honorable equals humble, and humble is vulnerable. Paul had pain in his life. 
He records it. He says, I have a nag. I have a thorn in my flesh. It's an irritant. It's bothering me. And I called out to the Lord in my pain. And I said, Lord, remove this. And God said, nope, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is going to be more obvious and made perfect in your weakness. In other words, I'm not going to remove your pain. I'm going to use the pain to move you. And that's why God allows us to be open by being broken. Pain isn't supposed to close us in, but when it's repurposed because you give it into the hands of Jesus, it actually should get you to call out. Pain is not supposed to isolate. Isolation leads to domination. The devil, if he isolates you because of your pain, and everybody's pain looks different in here, but I know this, the moment we experience some type of pain in our life, some type of sorrow, it can get us to isolate, clam up, and shut down. And that very closing in by ourselves, isolation will lead to greater pain. Ask anybody who got addicted to a drug or anything in, in the alcohol, any type of pain that was isolated, mismanaged, led to a greater pain mismanaged pain being managed by pain without calling out to God will lead to greater pain. Amen. What you may not know about my testimony is on March 1st, 2009, in the last professional soccer game I would ever play in, I tore my ACL and my meniscus, two ligaments in my right knee, a routine turn on the turf. I popped my knee out that week, a MRI confirmed it needed surgery to schedule. But that entire week, there was a physical pain that I was dealing with. And I would love to tell you today, church, that I managed the pain and I took the pain to the throne room of grace, but I didn't manage the pain. I thought that pain not only defined me, I thought that pain was going to be my destiny. I thought that I would never play pro soccer again. And because I had pain out of perspective and I isolated literally six days later on March 7, 2009, I went out in the city of Philadelphia. I engaged in drinking. I got into my vehicle. I didn't make it to my next destination. I wound up crashing, which resulted in an at-fault drunk driving fatality. Do you think the pain of my knee meant anything in that moment of pain? See, I mismanaged the pain up front. I didn't take it where it should have been brought. And I ended up causing greater pain, greater shame. And that's what led Jabez to call out on the God of Israel. Notice, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. Here's the question. Who do you call on when you're going through something painful? Do you call a friend? Do you call a therapist? Do you call out to your counselor? Do you call on the pastor? Or better than all of those, do you call out to the Savior? See, what we do not mind here at church is praying for one another. We just got done announcing we're going to be praying. Pastor Matt and I don't mind you coming up to us at the door and asking for prayer. We don't mind, now excuse the expression, but this is what's usually said. We don't mind you bending our ear. But I'm telling you that God has his ear bent towards you. Amen. And sometimes you don't have to go to anybody else. You can go directly to the problem solver. You can go directly to your savior. Psalms 116 verses one through four says it like this. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. The creator has inclined his ear and drawn even near to hear your prayer. Yet we so often bypass going to the one who controls everything and we go to a family member or a friend and we just vent. The pains of death surrounded me, the psalmist continues. The pangs of shield laid hold of me. This is a sorrowful experience. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. What did he do? He gave his pain to God. And that pain then became a passion. Because when you place your pain 
into the hands of God. Pain becomes the fuel of passion. Passion becomes the fuel of praying. And praying, church, is the ingredient of God moving. You want to see God move in your life? You begin praying with passion. Because the psalm doesn't end there. It says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the humble. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul. Look, he's talking to his soul now because he prayed. My soul's in distress. My soul is in sorrow. My soul's in pain. Yet I'm bringing it to you, Lord. Now he's saying to his soul, rest my soul for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And I say we can walk before the Lord because the Lord has already walked before us. <laughs> Jesus said, you will experience pain in this world. You will. It's a guarantee. I guarantee you that much. But if you experience me, you'll have peace as you go through the pain. And that's why we come to him with all of our sorrow and our pain. And that's why Jabez prayed, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. What is this word, oh? It is not a word that is pronounced like this, oh. It is a word that is pronouncing passion. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. And it's a request based on the promises of God. It's a matter of fact. It is saying, you will bless me because I'm claiming your promises and God can do nothing but uphold his promises. I turn this prayer personally. I pray this every single day before I wake up, but I say, oh Lord, that I may bless you indeed. That my life would be a blessing to you. That you would expand my opportunities and my influence and my territory for your namesake. Now, we don't know what Jabez did for a living. We don't know if he was a carpenter. We don't know if he was a warrior. We don't know if he was a farmer. We do not know, but he still prayed, enlarge my territory. This is a prayer a teacher can pray. This is a prayer a lawyer can pray. This is a prayer a social worker can pray. Lord, enlarge my territory. Expand my boundaries of influence. Give me greater opportunity to point to you in my current location. That's enlarge my territory. That's what Pastor Matt just got done explaining. We're asking God to enlarge our territory, to expand our borders, to push us out beyond a building into the community. I was up in North Jersey recently. I was with my lovely wife speaking in the public school system up in North Jersey. We decided, um, friends with a, a well-known evangelist who had an event up in that area, and my wife said, we should go. And it was in New York, New York. So I said to her, I don't know about going to New York. I just got done speaking all day. I'm tired. You know how New York traffic is. So she decided to look up the exact location. Where in New York, New York? Only to find out it wasn't New York, New York all along. It was the closest city to Tenafly, New Jersey, which is where the event was going to take place. We're nine miles away from the venue. So we say, let's go. So I text him, hey man, coming through to hear you preach tonight. We get there, we walk into a sanctuary. My wife goes to the bathroom and from the distance, I see a familiar sight. I see a shirt. Now, if you see people walking around coastal with worship over worry, grace over guilt, truth over trend, hope over hype, faith over fear, they're the shirts that my ministry puts out. And I see on the back of the shirt, a crown. And it's a familiar crown because that's on the back of those shirts. So I say, oh man, somebody else has a crown on the back of their shirt. So I get real close only to discover it's a hope over hype. So I'm blown away. I'm at somebody else's event and there's one of my shirts. So I'm waiting for Sarah to come out of the bathroom. I said, you won't believe this. This guy over there is wearing my shirt. She goes, who is it? I say, I don't know. She says, let's go talk to him. I said, no. So we go to our seats. And it's only a matter of time before they spot us. And it's a father, two sons, and what I would find out would be an uncle. And they come over as a family and they introduce themselves. And I don't know them. And then I say to the, the boy, where'd you get the shirt? He said, man, you spoke at my public school last year. And I was so amazed at your testimony. I followed you on social media. 
And then we followed not only you on social media, we followed your ministry. And then we heard that you were having a men's gathering and we actually came last summer. We were at your church in Ocean City all the way from North Jersey. And we've been so amazed at the impact of Soldiers for Faith Ministries and Coastal Christian. And then the father takes out his phone and shows me the Coastal Christian app right on his phone. And then he says, he opens it and he shows me Pastor Matt's last message. He goes, this message was awesome. And we sat there engaged in broader territory. You see what live streaming does? It gives us access beyond the building all over the world. And then the app gives those people access to us. And that's the prayer of this ministry. But what about your prayer? What if your life was live streaming? Because it is. Your life is constantly streaming live for people. And if your life was an app and people opened you up, what would they have access to? Think about that. What type of influence are you offering and it begins with a prayer, a prayer that says, God will enlarge your influence when your influence enlarges God. God will enlarge your opportunities when your opportunities point back to God. Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my territory. But he got something right. He said, I don't want you just to enlarge my territory because I don't want you to just bless me and then leave me. I want your hand to be with me. Did you get that? What good is it for God to bless you and then take his hand off you? What good is it to him to grow you and then actually step away from you? See, the prayer is, don't just bless me, God. Keep your hand on me, God. And then the question has to be asked, how do we have God's hand of favor stay on us? Well, Peter would write very explicitly, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up. In other words, humbling yourself under God's hand isn't a one and done deal. It's not I've humbled myself, I've put myself under his hand. It's a constant daily devotion, Amen. putting yourself under the hand of protection, putting yourself under the hand of provision. Why? Because when I say, God, I'm under your hand, I am saying I am reliant upon your will. I am dependent upon your way. And I'm unwilling to leave this position because I know me. And if I get up from under your hand, I will go do things my way. And my way leads to, as the Proverbs say, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of destruction. So the greater prayer, of course, is God, don't just touch my life. God, keep me in touch with your life. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. That you would enlarge our opportunities, our influence, our territory, that your hand would be with us. Because without the hand of God upon us, nothing our hands commit to do will ever be prosperous. You can go take your hands and go raise a billion dollars. You can go build the largest skyscraper in the world with your hands. But if God's hand is not upon that project, that life, that initiative, then all of that success will actually be deemed failure for all eternity. Zechariah 4, 6 says it better than me. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It is his spirit that we as a church, we as individual believers are calling out for God to use and work. Your spirit, Lord, is what we crave. We can go build a bigger church, but if God's hand is not on it, then that will amount to nothing. In fact, Acts chapter five, this church movement begins. Jesus has ascended. He's left his Holy Spirit within a rag tag group of renegades. And it is an amazing movement that begins, that has echoed into the millions today, true believers. I find this fact interesting, how Jesus only had 12 disciples, yet his influence is exponentially greater than Hitler who had millions of followers. Only God can take one man or one woman and turn the world upside down. Acts chapter five, as they are making an impact in that area. There are people rising up and trying to stop the movement. 
And of course they beat them, they persecute them, they lock them up, they set them free, they go back out to the streets, they start preaching again. And then one of the spiritual leaders of Israel says, guys, stop messing with them. There have been people in our history that have risen up and their movement amounted to nothing because God was not with them. So listen here, if God is with them, you can't stop them. And if you keep fighting them, you're only fighting God. He then says, if God's not with them, then the movement will amount to nothing. Do you understand? If God is with us, and he is, nothing this world can dish at us can stop us. That's the hand of God. Finally, he gets into his ending, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. Sounds familiar because Jesus said something similar in his prayer. He said, if you want to pray, pray this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In, in other words, we're asking in humility for God to keep us from evil. Why? Because if we get caught up in evil, the evil will actually discredit his name. You know, when the believers get caught up in evil and temptation and we fall and we fail, it only discredits the fact that we call ourselves Christians. So I'm praying, God, keep me from evil and keep the evil from me. Parents, when's the last time we prayed? Keep the evil from my children. Keep their eyes from seeing the things they shouldn't see. Keep their ears from hearing the things they should not hear. Keep our tongues from saying the things they should not say. Father, I cannot do it in myself. I will fail. I'm asking for your spirit to keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. Do you see the connection? His name meant pain. His whole life was associated with sorrow and pain. Just the mention of his name would be a reminder of his upbringing. The request of his heart was, Lord, don't allow my name and the history of it trump the glory of your name. And I think that should be our prayer, that we should pray that the glory of God's name would trump the history of our name. Because we all have different backgrounds. Now in Genesis chapter 32, another man whose name means something. His name, his name was Jacob. And Jacob, in chapter 32, you will read about the most epic wrestling match in the history of mankind. Any WWE enthusiasts in here? Don't raise your hand, don't volunteer that. You want to read about a wrestling match? Read Genesis 32. And in this wrestling match, Jacob is wrestling with God. And they're wrestling all night. And in the midst of the wrestling, God dislocates his hip. It's an amazing feat. When you get a bruise on your hip, that hurts. Now imagine a dislocated hip. But before Jacob lets go, he says, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. And then God says, what's your name? It's a weird question considering God knows his name. But the reason he asked him his name is because he wanted to hear him to admit his name. He said, my name's Jacob. The word name Jacob means deceiver, supplanter, conniver, heel snatcher. Jacob's entire life was about manipulation, was about deception, was about conniving. And here God is saying, I can't put my name on you until you recognize your name is sinner. And that's confession. I am a sinner. And God says, thank you for admitting that. Now you are a son or daughter. And then he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And Israel means governed by God. He went from being a deceiver to one who claimed God as his governor. And yes, he walked with a limp after that. But that limp was a blessing because I know me. If I'm left in my own strength without a limp, I'm going to get to a location that is not part of God's plan for my life. I'm going to get ahead of God. But when I walk with a limp, when I'm reminded of a spiritual limp, an emotional limp, a relational limp, it's God's way of reminding me that I need to be dependent upon him for my Christian walk. And I can't get too far ahead of him. And the limp slows us down. The limp might actually be a physical limp. It may be a spiritual limp, but I'm here to tell you that is a blessing in God's economy. Not only a limp, but how about a label? Anybody got a label? I'm actually known more 
for being a convicted felon than for being a pastor. That's a label. But the limp and the label are nothing in comparison to God's grace, which is greater. And there's a reason we need to claim that every time we gather, because the limp and the label are painful, yet when given to God, they become useful. And here's why Jabez in verse 10, God granted him what he requested. So God granted him what he requested. Let me just end by saying it like this. Prayer that harmonizes with God's heart will be prayer that moves God's hand. And we have the boldness to approach his throne room of grace, not because we are worthy, mm -mm, but because of God's mercy. God's mercy has made a way for us to approach him. That's the merit we claim. I'm not worthy, it's your mercy. And ultimately, we can readily go to the throne of grace because Jesus Christ went readily to the cross of pain. No pain, no gain. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless. As a church, we believe it's our job to connect our community to Christ. So if the message today impacted you in any way, we'd like to invite you to take part in our mission and share this message with family and friends. We'll see you next week.